and all of a sudden I hear this incredibly ominous voice and it said let's go get him well about that time I saw these ugly black gnarly looking creatures coming attached to the side of the airplane and when they did I heard the engine roll down I see me inside the cockpit doing all the emergency procedures and then I hear this incredibly authoritative voice that said not today Satan he still has work to do for me Number one, where is your emergency? Uh, yeah, I don't know where I'm at. I've had a plane crash. And I'm You're where? I don't know where I'm at. I've had a plane crash. Okay, you've had a plane crash? Yeah. I'd been down to Florida for a long weekend, spent the weekend in Anna Maria Island. And was leaving out somewhere about 1150-ish or so. Was, uh, the ceiling was low, about 2,000 feet, so I filed an IFR flight plan to get out of there. And took off and was going to do a direct all the way to my home airport in Noonan. And uh, everything was going great. Um, been flying probably for about two hours and 20 minutes or so. And Jacksonville Center had handed me off to Atlanta Approach, told me to descend down, maintain 5,000 feet. I was at 8,000 and call Atlanta. So I did that and uh, looked at the passenger that was riding with me and made the remark, man, this airplane's been running great. And um, about that time, uh, my engine had, uh, which was running at 2,350 RPMs, it had rolled back down to 1,500 RPMs really quick. Well, my heart skipped a couple of beats and I went into the emergency procedure mode with uh, air traffic control was calling me and telling me to get down, maintain 3,000, preparing to come into noon. And I was somewhere about seven to eight minutes away. And uh, I didn't respond to them the first time. I was a little busy and occupied. And so uh, they called me back about 45 seconds later and asked me to get down to 3,000 feet. And uh, I told them I had some engine difficulties. Um, I wanted to divert to a closer airport and I was going to need some vectors and going to declare an emergency. So they turned me to a heading of 180, which uh, was lining me up for a runway at Warm Springs, Georgia. And um, when I, I made the turn, um, the runway was 7.9 miles uh, off my nose and I had it made. I thought, and matter of fact, I told the passenger, I said, oh, we got this, no worries. And then the engine, about two minutes and 20 so seconds later, decided that it was going to roll down from 1,500 RPMs down to 500 RPMs. And then about two seconds later, it rolled down to zero. I started looking for options because the runway that we were lined up for was no longer an option. I was losing at this point when the engine completely quit I was losing about 1100 feet per minute and I just watched the runway go out of out of reach so I told air traffic control uh, after a, an attempted restart and um, there, it, 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 there was nothing on a restart And as I started getting closer, I started seeing these huge hay bales that were wrapped in white plastic. And for a second, I thought, well, I'm going to just kind of pick my way between it and, and because there was no other options, or so I thought. Uh, but then as I started getting closer, uh, some power lines that crisscrossed the field came into view, which totally ruled out that, that, that field. And so I looked directly over to my right and I picked the least dense thing that was out there. And um, I call it a, uh, an old logging road because that's what it appeared to be from you know, 3,000 feet or so. And I told the passenger, I said, we're not gonna make this field. I'm gonna put it on this logging road. 
we are going to crash. This is going to hurt. Um, a sound that I'll, that I'll never forget, that I never want to hear again, is uh, what it sounds like when, when trees hit your wings. Uh, for a pilot, uh, or it's, it's just, it's, it's just a very ominous sound. And so I'm in the trees and now everything has turned to, to extreme slow motion. Up to that point, everything was happening fast. You know, I'm dropping 1,100 feet per minute. I'm running, you know, 100 uh, miles an hour plus. Um, and so when I get into this, these, these trees, uh, I'm, I'm trying to slow the airplane down. But I'm also battling the length that I have to slow it down and put it down in. I could see where the, the smaller trees ended and, and the bigger trees began. And so at that point, uh, and I was in a bank, and I looked down, I remember looking down at my airspeed and I'd slowed it down to about 65 knots and I was thinking, you know, don't stall, don't stall, because that's certain death. And um, so I pushed it down. And when I pushed it down, I would just guessed where the bottom was. And so I made a really hard flare to take all the energy I could get out of it and slow it down. And then the tail hit really hard. And uh, the front end was probably, at that point, the nose was probably three foot high or so. And it, and it came slamming down. When it came slamming down, it appears that my seat belt had either came off or, uh, or it broke. My head goes up and um, I've got one hand on the yoke, the other hand on the throttle. My head goes up and I hit the roof. And I remember thinking, man, that hurt, but I didn't break my neck is what I was thinking. So then I come all the way back down and my butt goes all the way through the seat and hits the floorboard. And I remember thinking then, holy smoke, I just broke my back. Well now the, the nose of the airplane's uh, diving in and we're probably at this point, we're probably you know still 70 knots, which is probably 80 to 83 miles an hour, I would guess. And um, I see the windshield coming. I'm still flying an airplane. I've got, you know, there again, one hand on the yoke, and my right hand on the throttle. And I see the windshield coming, but I really can't do anything about it. So I just wince up and I hit my head. And I remember thinking, man, that hurt. Well, I fly back uh, and the back of my head hits the metal part on the seat. And I was thinking, man, that is excruciating because all this is just happening in such slow motion. And then a gift of God came, which was um, the right wing tip called a little bit larger of a tree. And it took the momentum and it spun us uh, a little bit to the left, which what, what that did for us, and there again, it was a gift of God. It, it gave us a, a little bit more room. And when it did, I, I came and I hit the, uh, the left side of my face against uh, the left windshield. I fly back, I hit the same spot on the back of my head on the same spot at the seat. And I'm thinking, man, this is crazy, this hurts. And there again, it's super slow. And um, I see the yoke coming, but I can't do anything about it. And I remember hitting the yoke, but then I don't remember anything else. And they say that I was out, knocked out, somewhere between 45 seconds to three minutes. I was, I was bleeding profusely. And they started praying, God, please don't let him die. God, don't let him die. And then I remember catching my breath back and coming back conscious. And it was kind of one of those, you know, <gasps> kind of things. And um, laying there and just blood is going everywhere. And I was, I was very concussed. You know, I broke my skull in six places. My face had fractured in seven places. And of course, my back broke in four places. Broke a thumb, broke an elbow, did some, you know, a little bit of dental damage. And uh, so laying there, concussed, um, my passenger said, um, Billy, we've got to get some help. Uh, the radios had gone out. I dropped off the radar. And um, so I had a, a cell phone that miraculously stayed in a pouch that I had uh, over to my left. So I reached down and got that. I called 911. We could hear sirens. And 
the 911 operator, uh, we, we, we kept getting disconnected and she would call back or, or we'd call back. And so finally I said, I'm gonna drop a, um, a pin to my son Tyler that I handed my phone to my passenger and said, will you drop Tyler a pin? Well, uh, they weren't familiar with that particular phone so they uh, inadvertently took a five second video of me in the cockpit and so the 911 operator calls. Tyler was able to give her the coordinates and what have you. Well, we were there, what appears from the 911 call to the time that they found us was about 51 minutes. I prayed, I said, God, give me strength to get out and go get us help. Well, the Lord in his sovereignty knew and his goodness knew that I was in no condition to get out and go get help, so he sent it. And. Um, uh, air traffic control had done an amazing job. They had, they had dispatched an airplane, and the airplane came and was dive bombing us to, to, to show the rescue workers where we were because we were in the middle of nowhere. And um, I remember I finally prayed. I said, God, please send us help. And a few seconds later, this guy pops up on my wing. He said, hey, man, we're going to get you out of here. But the woods were so thick, uh, they, they brought people in with chainsaws um, and they were cutting trees down. Well, they found a local farmer down there that had a bush hog. They were able to pull us out and they were, they were triaging me first because I was the one who had, had taken the most damage. Um, and so they, they pulled me out, put me on a backboard, and they put me on the back of a bush hog. And uh, probably one of the most painful bush hog rides, or yeah, the most painful bush hog, bush hog ride I've ever had. When they brought me into the emergency room, um, I was getting a lot of attention. And I knew it was bad because of the amount of attention I was getting. So I asked this guy, I go, where's all this blood coming from? He said, well, let me see your phone. So he took a couple of pictures and I looked at it. And I said, man, I'm in trouble. He said, man, you're tore up. <laughs> Really encouraging guy, thanks. Uh, but he, he was telling me the truth. And at that point, I just started praying. I said, God, I know I'm in bad shape. But Lord, don't waste this hurt. Don't let this be in vain. Don't waste this hurt. So I was in ICU for five and a half days. And uh, during that time, just, just miracle after miracle after miracle. And the one that I love to tell got a friend named Casper McLeod. He's a, he's a pastor and um, he comes walking into the room. In my left eye, we had been trying to ice it down and trying to get it to open and nothing was working. And he comes down and he said, Billy, can I pray for you? I said, please do. So he puts his hand on top of my head and he starts praying. And all I can tell you is it felt like somebody had taken warm honey and poured it on the inside of my skull and it just ran all the way down and stopped about at my shoulders. Casper said, Billy, I'll be back tomorrow. I said, thank you, I'll see you then. So he walks out. Simultaneously, two of my good friends who, who really don't know, who didn't know each other, they come walking in the room, they do the introduction at the end of the bed, and they're, they're talking for a few minutes, and all of a sudden, one of them says, Billy, kind of startled me. I go, what? He said, you're right. And before two witnesses, they watched they were able to see the swelling of that eye dissipate and the eye open up. And I knew then that was God showing me that and promising me He's going to bring me complete healing. One lady particular that I love to tell the story that she she comes in, you know, they they walk in and they go, Hi, my name is Tammy or whatever their name is, and I'll be your new nurse for the evening or for the day or whatever, and they erase and the other. Well, without exception, they would say, So what happened? I said, well, I was in a plane crash. Well, they would stop what they were doing and come to the side of my bed. And it always gave me a chance to point into Christ. And th this one nurse in particular, she walks in. She says, hi, my, uh, my name is so-and-so, and I'll be your nurse for the evening. And what happened? So I said, well, I had a plane crash. And she just literally dropped her marker that she was writing with and turned around and comes directly to the side of my bed and said, can you talk about it? 
do you, do you mind? This is fascinating. We don't, we don't have plane crash survivors up here, and if we do, they can't talk. I said, well, I don't mind. I don't mind telling you all about it. Well, I felt the Holy Spirit just start to take over. And I start telling her about it. And I said, nah, I have a father, Jesus Christ, who just came down and rescued me. And I looked at her and said, do you know who he is? And she said, I was raised Muslim, but I know the name. But I want to know what truth is. And I called her name and I said, can I pray with you? And she said, yes, please. So I put my hand on, on her arm and I just start praying. And I feel the Holy Spirit just, just speaking through me. And I remember hearing me say, uh, God, show her that you are the way, the truth, and the light. And I finish praying and I look up and this young sweet girl is just, you know, tears are flowing. And she looks at me and she said, I just want to know what truth is. And uh, I explained to her that we have a Heavenly Father that loves her so much that He wants her to know what truth is because He is the truth. The orthopedic surgeon, he walked in after they'd given me an MRI. And he said, well, Mr. Cranford, your back is in bad shape. You've had some burst fractures. You've had um, uh, uh, some compression fractures. You've had, uh, you know, th these other breaks that have gone on. He said, uh, and it's bad. We're going to be doing surgery in the morning. And I said, well, I don't, I don't, I don't want surgery. He said, well, you, you really don't have an option. And I said, well, the Lord's going to heal me. He said, well, great. Until then, we're going to do surgery. And I said, well, will you, uh, will you do another MRI? He said, I'll do you that favor. Before we take you down in the morning, I'll, I'll, I'll have another MRI done. But what he didn't know is, is there was a prayer meeting that was called and, uh, via Zoom, and over 8,000 people showed up for that prayer meeting. And they were praying specifically for my passenger and for me and for my back and that I wouldn't have surgery. So they wheel me down somewhere 4 or 4.30 in the morning, run me through the MRI, and about 6 o'clock, the doctor and his team walks into my room, and they're all dressed in their scrubs. He said, well, Mr. Cranford, um, you may be getting your wish. I said, how's that? He said, well, the pictures look a little different this morning than they did yesterday, and I think we can avoid surgery. And I said, praise God. And he goes, well, we must have gotten some bad pictures. I said, no, Doc, the Lord's bringing me healing. He promised me. Almost 10 months. And I'm a walking, talking witness to God's goodness, to his healing power, to his faithfulness. You know, the scripture says, Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around and about them to fear him, and he will deliver them. In Psalm 119, it says that the angels will, will lift us up in their hands. So I'm, I'm sitting there in my quiet time, and I'm just I'm going, Lord, it, 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 it was so traumatic, but God, thank you. And all of a sudden, I, I, I have this vision, and I've never had a vision in my life. And I have this vision, and I'm sitting there in my office, and I have my children that are walking through, and, it's, and they're, they're very distraught and sad. And God gave me a glimpse of what it would look like if I hadn't been there that day. And man, it really just, I mean, it just, it just wrecked me. So, you know, a little bit later, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting over uh, in my house and I'm just kind of distraught and wrecked about, at, at what God had shown me about the, you know, what he spared, that he loved my children so much that he spared me. And he loved me so much that he spared me from permanent injury could have easily been paralyzed. And I'm and I'm just sitting there and I'm and I'm and I'm asking God, Lord, how did this happen? How did this happen? And at that point I had this, this vision. And it was the second vision I've ever had in my life. The one was just twenty minutes earlier. And all of a sudden I'm outside the airplane. 
and I see the airplane flying, I see me in it, I see my passenger, I see the landscape below, I see the sky above. It's, it's, yeah, it's just, I mean, I see all the, everything. And all of a sudden, I hear this incredibly ominous voice. And it said, let's go get him. Well, about that time, I saw these ugly, black, gnarly looking creatures come and attach to the side of the airplane. And when they did, I heard the engine roll down. I see me inside the cockpit doing all the emergency procedures. And then I hear this incredibly authoritative voice that said, not today, Satan. He still has work to do for me. And about that time, here came these beautiful white um, angelic looking creatures. They didn't have wings, but they were just these beautiful creatures that just came. And there's a battle going on over this airplane. And I watched the airplane turn 180 degrees just like we did and, and uh, like we were instructed from ATC. And then I watch in here the engine roll down to nothing. And I watch the airplane start to drop. And I see my passenger put one hand on the airplane and one hand in the air and just start praying, which is exactly what, what the passenger did. And about that time, I saw many more of these beautiful creatures come and now they've outnumbered these black gnarly ones and they're throwing these creatures off this airplane. Well then the battle now is going on outside the airplane, off the airplane, while the few remaining angelic creatures grab the airplane underneath and they guide it all the way down. The next thing you know, I'm sitting back in my house. And I knew then that I, without a shadow of a doubt, that God was gracious enough to show me the battle that went on in the spiritual world. Never seen it. Never, never, you know, it's Ephesians 6.12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness, against spiritual wickedness. And that's exactly what happened. And I, and, I, and, I, and I think of uh, Prophet Elisha who was down in uh, the valley of Dothan and a servant came to him and he said, uh, look, we're surrounded by the enemy. And Elisha started praying and said, God, give him spiritual eyes where he can see the spirit world. And the Lord granted that and the servant saw that there were many more of God's army than there were of the enemy. And I look at this and I tell people that I would never sign up again for an airplane crash. It was not any fun. <laughs> but I wouldn't trade what I have learned, what I've seen, how I've seen God move. The miracles that have been just, just, just tangible miracles uh, several I guess it was probably about four months after the accident after the uh, off airport landing as I like to call it um, me and my brother and my son and a, and a dear friend of mine went back out to the crash site uh, it was just something I wanted to do to see kind of some closure to things and uh, we're looking uh, exactly where it was and uh, I'm standing right in the spot where the where the pilot seat was, and it was kind of it was kind of interesting because I just I, I, I knew it when I got there when I got in that particular spot I was like this is it and we pulled up pictures and sure enough I was about there and my buddy said hey Billy turn around and I turned around and 
there it was coming through the trees it was the perfect outline of my airplane and one of the takeaways that, that, that I've learned and that I got to witness is what my family and friends did they were the hands and feet of Jesus and I was flat on my back for basically 23 and a half hours a day for many days you know with a few exceptions and the people that would just call me up or text me and say hey I'm bringing you lunch I'm bringing you dinner or I'm just coming by just to talk to you it was it was it was a revolving door and that's the hands and feet of Jesus that I got to see what am I doing to be the hands and feet of Jesus because now not that I wasn't sympathetic to people before and their struggles or whatever, but now I'm really empathetic. And I want to be the hands and feet of Jesus because people showed me that love. I saw God in a tangible way. I saw Him move in a tangible way. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that His angels guided that airplane. I'm just not that good to put it where it had to go. Just not. Did he use my hands and feet? Absolutely he did. Absolutely. But it was the power of God that sent his angels to bear me up in their hands. We got down to the foundation. I was, I was, I'd lost 17 pounds. Uh, there was times to where Satan was whispering in my ear that things were hopeless. I was always going to be a back pain sufferer and I wasn't going to stand up straight and I wasn't going to do this and all of that, all those lies that came from the enemy. And what I've learned is that the foundation is solid. God's promises will trump Satan's lies every time. Every time. And I've learned that that God is a God of miracles, a God that, 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 that performed miracles in the Old Testament and the New, in, in the New Testament. He's still the God of today. I've learned that, that He is unwavering even if I am. Even if I waver, God is solid. He is there. Um, you know, people ask me and said, well, are, are, are you going to fly again? Well, the answer to that is, um, uh, yes, and, and, and I have some already. And, well, well, aren't you scared? You know what? The Lord's already shown me He can deliver me now. I'm not going to be foolish. You know, uh, we're not, I'm not going to do any, I'm, I'm going to be diligent and, and, and focused and, and careful and do everything that I can do just, just like I did during the crash. Uh, but, oh, death, where is your sting? You know, I, I, I had four and a half minutes, pretty much, to face death, right in the face. There was no sting there. People said, well, dude, you, you must have panicked. No, I, I didn't. Where did my calm come from? It came from the assurance that, look, Lord, if it's my time, it's my time, but I'm going to do everything I can to save my passenger's life. And to God be the glory. And if the worst thing that can happen to me is I get sent to heaven, so be it. But the death doesn't have the sting. And I'm not going to live in fear. I want to. Uh, I want to live in faith. I want to live uh, to be able to. You know, Jesus said, "Came to give us life that we may have life more abundantly." And living in fear is not having abundant life.